and he takes a basin of water and he gets down at the feet of the disciples and he begins to wash their dirty feet. Now think of it. Tomorrow afternoon he's going to be dead, crucified, nailed to a tree. And the night before he dies, he's taking off his robes. He's wrapping himself in a towel. And he's washing the disciples' dirty feet. That's love. How about you and me? We're too busy. We wear the, the robes of busyness. I'm so important. I have this position, this title, this job. I hurry and scurry throughout Singapore because I am such a busy, important person. We don't want to be wrapped in a towel, do we? Towel is a terribly vulnerable thing, isn't it? Suppose I came to your house tomorrow morning and knocked on the door and all you had on was a towel. What would you say? Go away. Come back later. I'm not here. Why would you say that? All I've got on is a towel. Very vulnerable. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. The essence of love is vulnerability is a towel. And we don't like to be vulnerable. We like to be strong, keep people out here. We want to control. Not so, Jesus Christ. Now I know there are groups of believers who actually have ceremonies where they wash one another's dirty feet. And I think that's beautiful. But it means so much more. Dirty feet means problems, heartaches, burdens, concerns. Someone who will just listen. The problem is people have dirty feet 24 hours a day, not from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sometimes they have dirty feet at 2 in the morning. They want someone to love, someone to care, someone to listen, someone to share. Most of the time they don't even want answers. They just want to know that you care. But you and I have to be approachable, vulnerable. We have to come across in such a way that people feel free to come to us. We read the scriptures and we don't see Jesus jogging through Judea or galloping through Galilee. What is he doing? He's walking. And he's walking slow enough so that a hemorrhaging woman can reach out and touch him. But your lifestyle here seems to be about the same as our lifestyle in the United States. You've got freeway Christianity here in Singapore. Everybody's going down the street. You know. Going in tight circles. 
Honking at your own tail light. Beep beep. Slow down. We have a godly pastor in Los Angeles whose name is Chuck Swindoll. He said one one day one of his teenage daughters to him and came to him and said, "Dad, I want to fuck you." And he said, "Well, sweetheart, talk slowly." And she said, "Okay, Dad, then you listen slowly." Ooh. What do we say? I got three minutes. What's on your heart? People don't talk. And Jesus Christ goes on to say, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Let me ask you a personal question. Don't, don't answer uh, at least out loud, answer to yourself. How often do you use the word ought? That's a powerful word. You ought to do something. Now in the English language, the word ought is imperative. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to pray about it. You ought to do it. You must do it. That's what it means. And I don't know about you, but I am actually working at trying to be careful and, and not to overuse or to abuse that word. I'm trying to communicate to people, well, have you given any thought to this? Have you prayed about it? Whatever. Put it in the form of a question. Unless it is something so compelling and mandatory that there really are no reasonable alternatives. Then you can say, you ought to do this. And beloved, when Jesus Christ says you ought to do something, you don't have to pray about it. Something you have to pray about is the particular application. But the principle has already been established. You ought to do it. You say it's not convenient. I'm going to die tomorrow. wasn't convenient for him either. He was going to die the next day. And this is love. It's involvement with other people's needs and heartaches and problems and burdens. It's being available. It's taking off our robes of busyness and rank and title and position. And proper as those may be in a certain environment. They are not when it comes to being available to show love. He said, you're my disciples if you love. Now, you and I have to be the way the Lord made us in terms of our temperament and personality. And I'm not suggesting that, that we undergo some phenomenal transformation of character and personality. And not at all. You may be a shy person, and that's wonderful. Or you may be gregarious and outgoing and that's fine. You may be very sanguine, phlegmatic, choleric, melancholic. OK. 
okay. That's the way the Lord wants you. It's the way He made you. Don't change. But for all of us, the word is love, care. You do it your way. Your personality, your gifts, your temperament, your style. But love. People don't need more things. People are starving for lack of love. Just someone who cares. Jesus said, people will know that you're my disciples. Not that you all go to the same church. Not that you all sign the same doctrinal statement. Not that you all dress the same way, walk the same way, live the same way. Not that you all drive the same car. No. People will know that you belong to me. That you carry my name that I have changed your life, that, that I have given you eternal life, people will know that if you love. Now the third evidence of discipleship is bearing fruit. John chapter 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so show yourselves to be my disciples, followers, growing people. Fruitfulness in the scripture has two basic definitions. One of them is character, the other is influence. And I think the Lord has both ideas in mind here as he shares with the disciples. Character. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 tell us that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control. Now let me ask you another personal question and you answer it but not out loud. Unless you want to whisper to your neighbor. That is a statement by the Apostle Paul concerning the fruit of the Spirit. The consequence or the result or the evidence of of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control. Now, the question. Have you ever in your whole life met a Christian person whose life was not filled with love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and self-control. Have you ever met a Christian like that? Hmm? This morning when you were shaving, <laughs> or combing your hair maybe you're busy and you're hurrying to work 
and all of a sudden somebody runs right through a red light and you swerve the car and you step on the brake and screech and the car slides sideways and you barely avoid a terrible collision with a car that ran through the red light and you, the driver, are filled with love and joy and peace. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> you dumb driver. You don't have any, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sure. It's true of all of us, isn't it? Let's just plead guilty. What do we do about it? Well, all I can tell you is what I do. Part of my quiet time each morning. I pray over Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I say, Lord, today, I pray that by the power of your Spirit in my life, you will fill me with love and joy and peace. The other evidence is of the Holy Spirit. I have to pray about it. Because if I don't pray about it, if I don't internalize it, if I don't take the Word of God back to the Lord in prayer and make it part of my life, it doesn't happen. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need some legalistic ritual and that every day at a certain time we, we say our little list and that automatically that makes it true. That's not the point. I'm not saying that if you forget to pray over it some morning that the Lord is going to pull the rug out from under you and you fall flat and the whole day is ruined. No. I'm talking about a principle. That we internalize, we embrace, we experience these exceedingly great and precious promises as we make them a consistent matter of prayer. And by this, we glorify the Father. By this, we manifest our following Jesus Christ by the fruit of our lives, the character, the fragrance, the perfume of His presence in our midst. One of the meanings of fruitfulness is character. The other is influence. Proverbs 11.30 says the, the fruit of a righteous person is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. Influencing other people in their relationship to Christ, whether or not to become Christians or whether or not to grow as Christians. But influence. Touching other lives. Ultimately, only two things, even in the beautiful island of Singapore, are eternal. People and the Word of God. Everything else, beautiful as it may be, someday is going to burn. That's one of those thrilling promises that you read in the book of Peter. 
the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned. Isn't that exciting? All of these magnificent buildings. You go into some of these hotel lobbies and they're 12 stories high and the waterfall and the lights and the beauty and they're magnificent structures. And while we have them, we care for them. But you don't give your life to it. Because someday it's coming down. That beautiful car that you polish so carefully is rusting on the other side. Yeah. And if rust doesn't get it, the junk man will get it. Now, while you have it, take care of it. Whether it's your flat or your car or your wardrobe or whatever God has entrusted to your care. The living God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Wonderful. Enjoy it. But don't give your life to it. because it's temporal, it's transitory. In the scheme of eternity, Jesus Christ said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? The inner person, the soul, the eternal being of one human being is worth more than all the wealth in the whole world in the eyes of God. People are forever in the Word of God. Now, if you and I are going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we're going to be totally committed to people we're going to care for people. We're going to pray for people. Now, there are only three things that you and I can do to help other people. Teach, pray, and be an example. That's all Jesus Christ did. And we'll talk a little bit about that, Lord willing, tomorrow afternoon. But we commit ourselves. We make ourselves available. And you say, well, boy, I, I don't have the training. I don't have the preparation. I don't have the, the experience, the know-how. Fine. That's why the navigators are here. Then you talk to Jim Chu or Robert Go or, or one of the other men or women on the staff and you say, I need help. That's why they're here. To help you. Not so that you become some reservoir of spiritual knowledge but you become a channel a stream the reason the Dead Sea is dead is because all the water flows in and nothing flows out there are a lot of Dead Sea Christians around they go to church every week like little baby birds in a nest you know glug 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 and they get the weekly worm from the preacher and they are bloated baby birds. If they ever got out of the nest, they would fall to their death. We give our lives to people. We teach. And we pray. And we model. We do it formally, informally. We do it structured. We do it unstructured. We do it planned. We do it casually. But we invest our lives in people. We influence people. 
Want to know something? You're already influencing people. The only question is which direction? You're already an example. The only question is what kind? Jesus Christ says, this will glorify my Father that you bear much fruit. Christ-likeness in my life and then intentionally, gently, sensitively, caringly influencing another man or woman for Jesus Christ. So if you need help, ask for help. Talk to your pastor. Talk to some other godly man or woman in your church. Talk to a navigator. But get help. It's available. Some of you have gotten help. and Some of you have been in Bible study. And some of you have memorized a few scriptures. But you're kind of sitting on it. You've got your little bag of spiritual nuggets. The Lord wants you to give them away. The only way to increase your own capacity is to be involved in the lives of others. You don't need to be some great spiritual giant, some knowledgeable theologian. You just need one other person to share your life with. Christ-likeness, influence. Let's close where we started. Jesus Christ wants you and me to be disciples. John thought about it for a half century. Then he wrote the book. Perhaps there were other things. We don't have the whole story. But what John said was, in his gospel, a disciple is a man or woman who continues in the word of God. A disciple is a man or woman who walks in love. A disciple is a man or woman who bears fruit. And it's a process. And it goes on all the days of our lives. You may graduate from Bible college. You never graduate from Bible study. We may have been loving last week. We must be loving today. We may have influenced someone six months ago. Are we involved today? He said, be disciples and make disciples. That's the continental divide. And how you relate to that truth governs your career, your job, your marriage, your family, your children, everything else in life. depending on how you relate to Jesus Christ and his desire for you expressed in his word. Let's close our hearts and close our eyes and bow our heads and just have a word of prayer, shall we? <clears throat> our Father, we thank you for the simplicity and the clarity of the word. Give us the courage, Lord, to be honest in our response, sensitive to your spirit, open, teachable, eager to be involved in what's on your heart, not only for our lives, but for Singapore and for Asia and for the uttermost parts of the earth. 
we pray with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, Amen.